Does ETSU really want to continue to win in college basketball? I know. Hi, everybody. I'm Marky e. Bilson, and I'm asking at least at a do they want to win at a high level? Are they serious about becoming the next mid major power? And considering the contract that they just gave Jason Shea, the terms were just released, I don't think they are. Now, Shea's going to make a quarter million a year base, which actually is slightly more than what ETSU pays their football coach, Randy Sanders. But it is not a leading contract in the Southern Conference. No longer does ETSU have the highest paid coach in the Southern Conference. That now is Wes Miller. And, you know, $250,000 base salary, there's... Uh, you know, fifty thousand dollars worth of like incentives that are just falling out of bed stuff, and then you know there are other things that that we'll get into here in just a little bit more incentives that can make it more lucrative than that. He'll be making more than three hundred thousand dollars a year on this contract, and in fact, it lasts three years, and uh, he could very well come away over the next three years with more than a million bucks. It shouldn't be that much of an effort for shade. To do that. But the thing is, it really isn't that good of a contract as compared to a Southern Conference peers. Peers like, let's say, oh, I don't know, down in Chattanooga, Lamont Paris. Now, Paris has a $250,000 base salary. His contract runs through 2025. Shea's contract was only three years. This is big. And this is something that ETSU has done historically. They did it with their football coach, Paul Hamilton. And it was a, a real flashing red light that they weren't serious about having a good football team. And eventually, as you know, in 2003, ETSU cut football. They were giving Paul Hamilton, their coach at that time, year-to-year -year contracts. You cannot have a good football program that way. Uh, basketball, well... There's the idea when you have four years on the contract, and this is pretty much standard in college athletics, when there's four years on the contract, uh, you go to the high school kid, and it's the guarantee that the coach will be there. Jason Shea at ETSU only has three years. You can bring in all the JUCOs you want, but that isn't really a overwhelming vote of confidence to the new coach. And I mentioned Lamont Paris is making $250,000 a year. Now, I realize that Paris has been a coach for three years at Chattanooga, but his record is 42 and 56. Don't you give the five-year assistant coach to Steve Forbes the a superior amount of money, especially when he's been a part of two Southern Conference championship teams? Uh, Paris, for instance, has that contract, but he has never been a part of nine straight NCAA tournaments. Yeah, Shea has when he was an assistant coach at Wisconsin-Milwaukee in Tennessee. Paris has never been part of a coaching staff that was coaching the number one team in the nation. Shea was, yeah, when he was at Tennessee. And of course, 130 victories uh, as the right-hand man of Steve Forbes these last five years, that's not bad. And in fact, if you want to keep it going, you might want to give your coach a better contract than what Chattanooga is giving theirs. And it really does make Shea look like he was hired, not because he was the best coach for the job, which I think he was, but it makes it look like Shea was hired because he's the most economical. You know, their national search, which I didn't think that ETSU should have had a national search. I think, oh, Steve Forbes isn't here. Uh, let's not try to disrupt things. Let's make his top lieutenant the coach, which is what they wound up doing anyway. But only after flirting a little bit with Chris Jans over at New Mexico State. Well, Chris Jans earned $429,000 with all his incentives with the Aggies last year. And it's going to take a heap of work and winning, I mean, doing things in the NCAA tournament, to make $429,000 on Jason Shea's contract. So it really does look like, well, uh, Shea was hired because he was the economical guy. Let me put it to you this way. 
if ETSU wins the national championship in 2021, Jason Shea, with all his incentives, is probably going to wind up making $150,000 less than what Steve Forbes did at ETSU just last year. Maybe uh, Shea should be talking to Forbes' agent and seeing if he won't represent him. I don't know. Uh, there's even this contract. There's one thing in this contract that kind of bugs me. Uh, Shea gets a $15,000 raise and one more year extension on his contract if he wins 25 games in a season, which sounds on the surface like, yeah, okay, fine. But first of all, that's not a whole lot of money. But second of all, doesn't that incentivize you to schedule soft? Now, next year, ETSU, they got to go to Appalachian State, which won 18 games last year. Uh, and also, they've got to go to Mississippi State. But don't you think that in the future, if, hey, I get $15,000 and my contract is extended, no ifs, ands, or buts, if I win 25 games, aren't you scheduling more Cleveland states and Delaware states in the future? than Mississippi states and Louisiana states? I don't know. I would do so. Uh, and so you got to start to wonder about the commitment to have a top-flight mid-major basketball program. I mean, it's almost like they're incentivizing scheduling soft here, but also they're not paying Shea what his peers make, and I think that he has earned it. The other thing is they're not giving him a contract that'll ward off other mid-majors. Uh, Steve Forbes did have a contract that basically he wasn't going to go to UTEP. Okay, they weren't going to be able to pay him significantly more than what he was going to make at ETSU, so why make the switch? Now, what we're going to have is a situation now where those other mid-majors might actually look at the ETSU coach if Shea is successful. And if he isn't given a raise or, you know, say, hey, we can beat that $250,000 base. Hey, Jason Shea, how'd you like to make $500,000 a year? Remember, a generation ago, Ed DeChillis actually interviewed at College of Charleston, which was a Southern Conference rival at the time, and Duquesne before he wound up going to Penn State. Duquesne and C of C were not significantly better basketball programs, if better basketball programs at all, than ETSU. But he interviewed there. Why? Well, if you're not getting the coin, uh, you know... Right now, the highest paid coach in the Southern Conference, Wes Miller at UNCG, he's got a little more than $300,000 a year coming to him base, plus incentives. He made almost $400,000 last year. So my question is this, would it have killed ETSU to have given their basketball coach, Jason Shea, $52,000 more a year, which would have made him the highest paid coach in a Southern Conference? Would it kill them to give him a contract that goes to 2024? Wes Miller's contract, for instance, extends through 2029. If I am being recruited by Wes Miller, I pretty much know that unless North Carolina is coming to call, uh, he's going to be my coach. I'm not so sure with Jason Shea. And I think this is one of the reasons why it looks like ETSU is going to have no starters returning back from their 30-victory team last year. Now, three of them were seniors. Okay, can't do anything about that. But Bo Hodges is being pursued by uh, the likes of Arkansas and Butler and Minnesota, as well as Tennessee State. And maybe, just maybe, if I decide, I'll return to ETSU. It looks like his backcourt mate, the point guard, Davian Williamson, is going to depart. Uh, the San Diego Union Tribune is reporting, there's a reporter there named Mark Ziegler, that his top two choices to play at in the future, Davian Williamson, the ETSU point guard, San Diego State, or Wake Forest, which would be returning to his hometown, and of course, Steve Forbes, the former ETSU basketball coach, gone to Wake Forest. Hmm. But it really does seem like there is this, well, we'll give you this, but we won't give you that with ETSU. We won't give the contract. We won't give what needs to happen to continue an elite mid-major program. Maybe a good mid-major program, but not an elite one. 
That's what this contract, and really having a search, has said about their program. What administration? The administration that so many fans said, I have complete faith that they'll find the right coach. Well, I think they have, but I don't think they're treating him very well. And I think the players are picking up on that. And that's why two of them are in the transfer portal. And that's why ETSU could have no starters returning next year. Now, I do think that their situation won't be grave. I don't think it'll be as bad as when Chattanooga, three years ago when Lamont Harris came in, didn't have any starters returning. Uh, the cupboard won't be necessarily bare. You've got Patrick Good, Ladarius Brewer, the transfer coming in from Southeast Missouri State, and of course the seven-footer Octave Ann Corley manning the middle. So there's a chance at ETSU. I mean, I'd be surprised they didn't have a winning record, but the way it stands right now, especially if Bo Hodges doesn't come back, I don't see them return, repeating as SoCon champs. And if they do, I see a contract that a lot of schools will look at and say, hey, that was one heck of a coaching job that Shea did. Let's see if he wants to come here for more money. Not the way you build a good mid-major basketball program. Folks, I'm Marky e. Bilson, and I'd like it if you followed me on YouTube. I've got my own channel there, so subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hit the bell. I've got new content up on my uh, channel every day. The archives of my old show, and of course the recent podcast where you get the hardest-hitting opinions on ETSU basketball, or certainly sports in the Tri-Cities, Tennessee area, as well as uh, a larger uh, scale. I am now writing about the Pittsburgh Steelers once again, doing it for a website called stillcurtain.com, S-T-I-L-L-C-U-R-T-A-I-N.com, stillcurtain.com. Got a couple of things up there. Looking forward to doing more work with them. And of course, my Medium page, which uh, has this commentary written out. So I ask you to like me on YouTube, follow me on Twitter, and more. And until next time, I'm Marky e. Bilson.